Hey guys, welcome to our Cut Like a Chef class. Today we're gonna to talk about how to use our knives properly and safely. So here in Knifeware, we specialize in Japanese kitchen knives, which you might have already been able to deduce. These guys are made out of some pretty incredible steel. Really, really hard stuff that holds an edge extremely well. But with that also comes a little bit of responsibility. They're a little bit more fragile, they can get chipped a bit more easily, and they're really sharp. So if you're not using them right, you can cut yourself pretty bad with something like this guy. The first thing we want to talk about is just some shapes, just some basic overall stuff here. We got a few different ones on the board here. This is sort of like your, your chef's knife. This is called a Yuto. This one is made by Teriyasu Fujiwara, 240 millimeters in length. This is sort of a big boy. And this is what I would recommend for like everything. You know, when you got your everything knife, your sort of go-to if you wanted one knife in the kitchen, this is a great way to go. It's got a bit of a tip on here. It's got a bit of a belly. It's really good at sort of doing articulate tasks. There's a few other varieties though. This is called a bunka or a santoku. This is sort of like a smaller in scale. Hold them up together here. You can see they're a little bit of a different size. This guy's a little bit more manageable for some people. Uh, it's got a bit of a flatter edge along it too. So when you're chopping against the cutting board with this guy, you make a lot of contact. And the other knife we're gonna be using today is called a nakiri. And the Kiri is a, a sort of a rectangular shaped vegetable knife. This guy makes a great deal of contact with the cutting board, great for chopping veg, great for chopping like boneless meats and that sort of thing. You don't see these made by every, uh, every manufacturer, especially in the Western world, but I think it's got a, a great deal of value to it. These guys are phenomenal. So we're gonna use these three knives today. Let's talk about how you hold your knife. One of the first things that you do when you get your knife is you pick it up and you wave it around and you feel where the balance point is. So, your balance point is extremely important when you're talking about your kitchen knife. Now, every knife is balanced. It's just a matter of where it's balanced. There, you see sort of two different basic styles here. You got Western style with that sort of bolstered handle on here. It's got these rivets and a little bit more weight back here. On this guy, you got your WA style handle, which is a little bit more light. And it's got a bit of a more forward facing balance. So let's find our balance point on these guys. So with my Western knife, I'm gonna pick it up and I'm going to sort of hold it with two fingers and I'm going to find where it doesn't sort of teeter forward and I'm going to find where it doesn't sort of totter backwards. It's usually just past the bolster in this sort of area of your knife right here. Fujiwara-san has actually gone ahead and put this little divot in there so you can hold it really nice and close up to the tip of the blade here. So you'll notice I'm sort of holding the blade by the blade. It's not so much by the handle, you know, a lot of people pick up their knife and they hold it by the handle because it's called the handle, that's where you handle things from. But that's not actually gonna put us in very good control. Think about it this way. If you're writing an essay or a paper or something like that or a check and you got your pen, you don't hold it way up here and write with it like that. You sort of get really close, right? You got your hand on the, on the table and you're using it really close to where the action's taking place. It's the exact same principle with knives. So I like to grip up a bit on this knife and put my hand in a place where I feel like I'm in really good control. It's gonna balance for me. It's gonna feel lighter overall. Sort of grip up on that guy. The balance point is usually a little bit further forward on something like this. So you wanna grip up a little bit more. Both knives are great. It's all a matter of personal preference. It's just, uh, it's just finding what feels right to you. So a little bit further forward on this guy, a little bit further back on this guy. Now there's your basics of knife balancing and that sort of thing. So let's talk about Let's talk about how you're actually going to use this knife. My dominant hand holds a knife. My non-dominant hand is going to hold my food. So I got my carrot here. I'm going to cut this guy up. I'm, I'm sort of putting my, my, my hand on this carrot to steady it, but what I see a lot of people doing is holding the carrot really far back so they don't cut themselves, which is all fine and good, safety first, right? But it doesn't put me in a great deal of control over where my knife is actually going to end up. What I want to do is sort of grip really close to where I'm cutting, and I use the third knuckle on my middle finger, and that acts as a guide for where that knife is gonna end up. This is sort of your caliper knuckle right here, right? That's gonna sort of end up guiding my knife through. The rest of my fingers here, I sort of use as like a, a pinch, a claw. I sort of grip the food behind that middle finger and I rest my heel down either on the food or on the board. So I'm nice and planted, it's all nice and stable here. I use my middle finger to sort of guide where that knife is gonna go, and I just slide it through. This is super simple. It, it takes a little bit of practice to get the sort of feel of this sort of thing, but stick with it because it's really safe and it's easier to do. It's going to save you a whole lot of headache in the kitchen later on, right? So we're going to use that claw. We're going to grip up on our knife. We're going to bring both units pretty close together. There we go. This way we're going to end up with nice chopped vegetables and we're not going to cut ourselves. The board that we're working on, by the way, is super important. Your cutting board makes an enormous difference 
on how your, uh, your, your knife is gonna hold its edge. What you're looking for is something that's kind of soft and supple. This is a larch wood board, so when I take my knife and I cut into the board, I can actually feel the edge of the knife sort of getting right in there. That's a good thing, right? That means that it's not gonna dull out my knife. If you're using like a, a glass cutting board or a bamboo board, it's gonna slide around on there. It's gonna just ruin the edge of your knife super, super fast. So when I cut in to this guy, the edge of my knife sinks into the board a bit. This board is also great. As long as you keep these guys a little bit waxed, it's not gonna absorb any liquid or fluid or nasty stuff that can get into plastic boards quite easily. And it's really easy to clean when you're done. So there's your basics. Grip up on your knife, find your balance point, grip up on that guy, and use your, your non-dominant hand safely. Use that claw method. It's gonna make a huge, huge difference on the amount of band-aids you go through at home, right? It's super important. So before we really get into it, let's talk about some major do's and don'ts. It's mostly don'ts. So when we're working with our knife, uh, there's a few habits that a lot of people have. Namely, the biggest one is scraping food around on your cutting board using the edge of your knife. That sort of noise, that's what you want to avoid. And I can hear it from across the room. And I'll come get you if I hear you doing it. When you scrape food around with the edge of your knife, that's going to cause the edge of your knife to get dull. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to ruin the edge and you're going to have to hone or sharpen your knife much more frequently if you're doing that. So avoid using your knife as a tool to move food around on your cutting board. Put the knife down, uh, use your hands. Your hands are literally your hands. You can use them for just about everything you've ever done your whole life. This tool, as well as a food scoop, you can pick stuff up with that guy and then move it to your pot. Yeah, so avoid scraping. Another thing that I see a lot of people doing is this aggressive sort of rock chop motion. I don't know if you ever took driver's ed, but they always tell you don't turn the wheels of your car when you're parked because you're going to ball out your tires. It's the exact same principle with your knife. When you're doing that kind of motion, it's going to dull out the tip of your knife really quick. It's also really bad for your wrist. When you're moving your wrist around a whole lot, you're going to get into trouble. You're going to get carpal tunnel, you're going to get tendonitis. So take care of your body. I like to lock my wrist and move more with my elbow and my bicep and lift the knife with each slice, right? That's a big one. With the nature of these cutting boards, I find that the edge of the knife sort of grips inside of them a little bit, so don't put your knife into the board and then twist and torque around because that can cause dulling and chipping and that sort of thing. So let's, let's try to keep in mind how we're moving our bodies and how we're moving our knives, and that'll help your well-being and your knife over the long term. All right, so the first major component that we're going to chop up is our mirepoix. I don't know if you ever heard the term mirepoix before, but mirepoix is uh, sort of a, a nice melange of very sort of neutral flavors, very good and neutral flavors. So you're going to use carrot, you're going to use celery, and you're going to use onion. Those are your three primary portions of your mirepoix. Other ingredients that you can throw in there, bay leaf, garlic. Think about anything that you would stuff into the cavity of a chicken before you roast it. So broccoli, probably not awesome. It's going to get overcooked and it's going to kind of taste like iron. Uh, peppers get a little bit bitter. And you also want to think about flavors that are going to overpower the rest of your mirepoix. So like fennel and that kind of thing is really going to take over and it's all going to taste like fennel. So carrot, celery, onion, that's your big three in mirepoix. We're going to start with the carrots here. All right, so dicing up a carrot. The word dice, just like you're shooting dice, right? Uh, it means little cubes, uh, little, little cubes. There's small dice, medium dice, large dice, there's brunoise. There's a whole lot of variations on it, but the first step is always gonna be the same. It's peeler. So I'm sure you've all peeled a carrot before. The way I like to do it, it's half of it at a time. I hold it by the butt, put the tip in the middle of the cutting board. There we go, easy peasy, right? Extremely sharp little guy here. The main reason I like to peel my carrots this way is because they all end up in one sort of location on my cutting board. It's really easy to clean up when you're done. Carrot peels, by the way, you want to hang on to these guys. You can go into your stock. You can throw these into a bag, put them in the freezer. When you got enough vegetable scraps, you can make stock out of them. Super easy to do. Now let's work with this guy. So whoever designed the carrots did not really have dice in mind. They roll around on you. They're kind of long. Uh, we got to work with this guy a little bit before we can get it to a state where it's easy to manipulate and get a very, very sort of uniform and fine shape to it. So I'm going to grab this guy. I'm going to use my, I'm gonna use my Nikiri. So the first thing that I want to do is get rid of everything I don't want to eat. So the peel is gone. What else do I not want to eat here? I don't want this bit. So I'm going to use my claw. I'm going to cut this guy right off. There we go. Into the saw. The very tip where it's sort of dried out. I'm going to cut this guy right off. Easy peasy. So now we're at 100% yield on this guy. The rest of this, we are going to be able to eat. So, 
First things first, I wanna short it up. I wanna get that size right. Right now it's longer than my knife. So I'm gonna take this guy into, let's say three pieces here. Notice how whenever I'm working with anything that I'm going to continue working with, I sort of shove it into the top left corner on my cutting board. This will be my inbox, right? I work with as much space as I possibly can on my cutting board, and then my top right corner will sort of be my outbox, right? I wanna give myself as much space as possible. So when you start working yourself into a corner, that's when you're gonna hurt yourself, right? So my first restaurant job. I worked at a place called Pack Rat Louie back in Edmonton. If anybody from Pack Rat Louie alumni is watching this, yo, what's up guys? Uh, I worked for a guy named uh, who was a bit of a stickler for his, uh, his shapes and his, his knife skills and that sort of stuff. So on my first day on my stage, I was tasked with making brunoise vegetables. And if you're not familiar with what brunoise means, it's a three by three by three millimeter cube. And none of it could be round. It all had to be perfectly square. We put it into consomme. I did not really understand that dish, but okay. What I would have to do is take off all of the sides. I would take all of this off of here. and I would end up with sort of a rectangular prism of carrot. All of this, that goes into the stock. It's kind of wasteful. I don't really like being wasteful. This isn't a method I do at home, but then I would take it into little sheets. Oh man, I hope it's not watching. This is B plus at best. I would take my little sheets and I would put them in a little stack and I would cut them into my, if anybody knows of this name, I'll show you. this is a Julien. This is a carrot Julien. Mais oui, c'est bon, Julien carrot. It's out of the way here. And then I would take my Julien. Notice I didn't scrape my knife into it, but plant my knife, and then I sort of push everything into it, or I put my knife down completely, and I make a little bundle with my hands. At this point, use that claw. That claw is extremely important here. You wanna put your fingertips down on this guy, your pinky and your thumb gripping in from the side, like you're pinching it all in into the center like that. And then I get my brunoise carrot. Ah, c'est bon, mon ami. A brunoise carrot is a perfect size for your consommé. There we go. So if, if you have people over for dinner and they're taking a look at your carrots and they're going, oh, this piece is a little bit round and they need to leave your house. That's ridiculous. Uh, this is, it's nice, but I bet you're not going for a Michelin star at home right now. So we're gonna do something a little bit different. It's gonna clean up here. Let's do something a little bit different. What's really clutch is that first cut you saw me make on my cylinder of carrot here. I took off one flap. There we go. I take that one flap off. Now it sits still. This is really important. It's still on your cutting board. It's not gonna roll around like these pieces here. So you're in much better control of it. This piece that I cut off, I'm gonna keep. So I'm gonna put that off to the side there for now. So it's flat. What I wanna do now is make this into a bunch of these. And it's really easy to do now that it's sitting still. I use my claw, guide knuckle. There we go, beautiful. Now we have our little sheets of carrot here. I'm gonna take these guys one. If you're feeling ambitious, you can take a stack of two, but I'm just gonna do one at a time. And we're gonna cut these into our julienne. Beautiful, super easy to do. Once it sits flat for you, you'll notice that the control, I'm gonna do two here. Once it sits flat for you, you're gonna be able to control it a lot better. That claw is going to be a lot easier to maintain on there. There we go. We got a nice consistent julienne. So if I were making a salad or a stir fry or something that I'm gonna eat with a fork or with chopsticks, this is the perfect little size for you. Excellent little size. But I wanna be able to eat this with a spoon and this is hard. So I'm gonna cut them up a little bit further. I'm gonna take a little bundle of them. Just do three or four when you're starting out. Three, four, five, something like that. And make yourself a nice little bundle and tighten it up. Tighten it up. Use that claw and tighten that guy up so that you can be extremely gentle with your knife. That's really important. There we go. We'll scoot back every time. Once you get onto something that's a little bit harder to hold on to, just use less fingers. There we go. Beautiful little carrot dice. I'm gonna do up the rest of these guys here. Beautiful little carrot dice, super easy to do. Get practice with that claw. I know it seems awkward when you're first learning it. Don't try to go too fast. Take your time. Perfection isn't, isn't built overnight, right? There we go. Nice little carrot dice. This is really easy to fit into a spoon. 
All right, so we got our nice sweet carrots all diced up. Next, let's move on to our bitter celery. Uh, in the flavor wheel, you got you know salty and sweet and all this kind of flavor. I would say that celery sort of embodies like umame and bitter a little bit. So we got a bundle of celery. I never buy it when it's all pulled apart like that because this is so much more expensive. I also like all of the leaves in the center here. These guys are really delicious. Just tear them out and throw them into your mixed green salad. Let's just pull off one stalk here. So celery is really, really, really easy to dice. It already sits flat for us, which is really important. It sits flat on our cutting board. So we just have to take it from here, essentially. So what do we do first? I want to get rid of everything that I don't want to eat, right? I'm going to use my bunka for this guy. I'm going to take off the very top. I'm going to take off the very bottom. Notice how I only took like a couple of millimeters off each of these guys here. That's all that's required. Those guys can go into your stock. It already sits flat for us when we have it sort of rib side down on here. So all I need to do, I'm going to take this into maybe three pieces here. Perfect. Up in the top left corner of my board. So there's a few different ways that we can go from here. Personally, I always do it the easy way. I like to do things the easy way. I like to do it really quick. Uh, and I like to do it in the safest way possible. I always like to have my, my knife hit the cutting board. I avoid cutting horizontally whenever I can because it's a lot easier to, to sort of see it being done than actually doing it yourself. Cutting horizontally can be tricky because your knife disappears under your hand. It's easy to cut yourself. It's easy to mess up your food. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy and get my julienne by cutting it in half. I then take these halves. They sort of sit flat for me and I cut them into like three pieces depending on the size of your celery. That's perfect right there. Perfect little julienne. Three pieces there. There we are. So now we got our julienne celery. I'm just going to do one more here. Cut it in half. Let it sit flat, take it into two or three pieces, depending on the size of your celery. There we go. Nice julienne. Really, really easy to do. There's not much to this stuff. I then take these julienne, I bundle them up in my cutting board. I put them right in the center here. Claw goes down over top of that. Pinky and thumb at the side. Your fingers on top, just like that. Sort of squinch it all in. There we go, dice. So notice how I sort of release my fingers and I pull back every time. Be nice and gentle with your offhand there. That means you can be nice and gentle with your knife hand. There you go. Super easy, right? So what's really important is that we got it to sit flat for us, right? We got it to sit nice and flat on our cutting board. It's always going to be easier to chop up at the end of the day. And that goes for not just celery, not just carrot, but everything that you're cutting up. I'm gonna grab my food scoop here. I'm gonna blast her in the bag. There we go. Celery, done. Carrot, celery, onion. Onion is the most important ingredient in pretty much everything that you're doing. Onion is awesome. There are so many flavors in this guy, and depending on how you cook it, you're gonna get a lot out of it. So if I were to take a huge bite out of this right now, I'd probably feel deep regret with the decisions that led me to this moment in my life. When it is raw, it's really powerful, right? Everybody knows that. Onion smell, it, it, it hurts your eyes, it makes you cry. But if I were to dice this guy up and throw it into a pan with some, some butter and cook it really low, what happens? Well, it begins to sweat. That's the first thing that happens. All of the steam begins to come off. Once all of the moisture, which is by the way, the stuff that makes you cry, once the moisture is gone, then it can start to get really hot. The sugar in a yellow onion, there's so much sugar in here. So once it starts to get to that point above 100 degrees Celsius where water boils, that's when you start to get that sweet flavor. The sugars start to cook, they become a little bit more forward and you get a nice sweet onion flavor. I'm using yellow onions because I'm cooking them for a long time. They have the most sugar, they benefit the most from cooking for a long time. Purple onions, a little bit more mild. They sort of turn a weird color when you cook them for too long, they sort of turn blue. White onions are great, they have a lot more spice to them, they're really good in like salsa or something like that. Uh, but if I'm cooking onions and I can cook them for a while, like I'm making a pot of soup or a pot of chili, always use yellow. So first things first. What do we not want to eat on here? Well, that's easy. We don't want to eat the top. We don't want to eat the bottom. We don't want to eat the skin. So let's get rid of it. Big claw, slide on through that guy. Nice and easy. Same thing on the other side. Now it sits flat for us. Skin, tops, bottoms, all goes into the stock. All that stuff goes into your stock. Instead of peeling it at this point, I'm going to cut it in half first. At that point, it's really easy to get a thumbnail underneath that, that layer of skin. You can pull that guy right off, into the stock. Right into the stock. Ah, all right, so, look at that. That's appetizing, right? 
That's exactly what we want to have here. So what I'm going to do with this guy, I'm going to take off an additional layer and I'm going to take a look at it. This is actually awesome that this happened. I take off an additional layer. This guy right here, I'm actually just going to cut that stuff right off. I don't really want to eat it, so I'm not going to. I mean, this onion costs what, like 17 cents? So I'm just going to work with what I got here. I don't like wasting food when I don't need to. So before we started cutting this guy up, we want to get dice. We want to get little squares with this guy. So before we actually start dicing up, let's take a look at it. Before we cut it up, there's a bunch of circles. You got your circumference, you got your diameter, you got a radius. Think about a radial line. It's a hand on a clock. It goes from 12 o'clock to one o'clock to nine o'clock. I want to cut a bunch of radial lines into this guy. So you've probably seen people doing this sort of thing where they cut into it horizontally. I don't feel great about cutting horizontally. I always like to hit the cutting board. So I want to cut into this guy like the hands of a clock, starting at the outside and moving down towards the center. I want to cut radials into this guy. So here's what I'm going to do. Using my claw, I'm going to cut one piece here. It's still attached at the back end there. See what I've created? A little flap, a little flap there. I'm going to keep going until I'm at that 12 o'clock position. Now I'm cutting straight up and down. There we go. Look at that. And it's still all attached to the back here, so it's easy to manage, right? I'm going to keep going all the way around. Once I start running out of room for this hand here, I'm going to move it over to that side and continue. So there we go. I put a bunch of radial lines into this guy. Now it's not important that you bust out like your protractor or something and measure all these angles. As long as you're getting towards the center, it's not a huge deal. Once I start dicing, there we go. Beautiful. Super easy, right? Look at all that. Perfect. Nice little dice. Nice little dice. I'm going to keep going here. There we go. Perfect. Way easier. It's so much easier than doing that horizontal method there because I always have my knife making that sound. It's always hitting the cutting board so it always tells me when I'm done cutting. What you might end up with at the very end though is something like this. Your little onion butt. The onion butt can be the bane of your existence. If you look close around the top here, I can still sort of see some of those radial lines. I'm just going to pretend I'm chopping up a rainbow. There we go. Mix it all together. No one will even be able to tell. Perfect. Way easier to do. Way, way easier to do. So I'm going to pop this guy into my bag. The rest of my mirepoix. So carrot, celery, onion. We have sweet. We have bitter. We have spicy. Work together to create a very lovely little melange of all sorts of flavors. It's the basic components of pretty much every dish you'll make. Sort of a lawful, neutral kind of flavor, right? There we go. All done. All right, so let's hit up some stir fry veggies. One of my favorite parts of a stir fry is always the broccoli. And broccoli is a bit more complex than you might think. It's got the floret portion and the stem portion. I'm going to use both. So the florets taste a little bit more metallic. It's almost got some like iron flavor in there. Whereas the stem is a little bit sweeter. So we're gonna take advantage of both of these parts. The only bit that I don't wanna eat are these little leaves. So I pull these leaves off of the side here. Pretty easy to do. So when you're cutting up broccoli, the biggest pitfall you can make is cutting the broccoli. Because as soon as I sort of put the knife into this area, all of these little things, all these little little beads fall out of here. So I actually want to avoid putting my knife into this. I'm going to use a knife with a bit of a tip because what I like to do is hold this guy upside down and then using the tip of my knife, sort of go around and take them off piece by piece. All my little florets there. Super easy to do. You can do this with a Nakiri as well. I just find it's a bit easier to do with that more articulate tool with the tip of this knife than it is with anything else. Once I get to the center there, I take that off all as one. There we go, we got our stem, we got our florets. So your florets, I want them to be bite-sized. That's really important, because when you're eating a stir fry, you're usually using chopsticks or a fork. So I want to make these guys really easy to get in my mouth. So to do that, again, I don't really want to cut all the way through. I put the knife part way through that little guy there, and I just tear it. A little tear it. Let's tear it apart. That's the way it wants to come apart, so I'm just going to let it happen. There we go. Super duper easy. Tear that guy right on up. So what you're aiming for here is pieces that you can fit into your mouth really easily. We don't want big, giant, chunky, blocky bits. Broccoli cooks pretty fast. When I'm making a stir fry, I usually like to have a few different components to it. I like to have my aromatic vegetables. I like to have my, my meat. And I like to have my more colorful vegetables, like these little guys here. These cook super fast, so these go in right at the end. So will this guy, but this is really hard. So 
the harder your food is, the more dense it is, usually the slower it cooks. So without changing the heat, how do I make this cook faster? It's easy. You gotta slice it really thin. I got no control over the volume of this thing, but I do have a lot of control over the surface area. And the more surface area it has, the faster it's gonna cook. So what I like to do to give myself a bit of an easier time, cut this guy right in half so it sits still on my cutting board. Now I wanna slice this guy up as thin as humanly possible. So I'm gonna take off a little bit from where it's all dried out. Broccoli, by the way, not great in your stock, so keep it out of there. At this point, I wanna slice it super thin. So that's where I use my claw to my great advantage here. And I can really get this guy nice and thin. I, I lean right over the cutting board and I look exactly where the knife is gonna go. And I get some nice thin slices out of this guy. This is what I'm looking for here. Really nice thin slices that cook really quickly and give you a lot of nice sweet flavor in your dish. There we go, that's what we want there. Nice thin pieces. Those are gonna really pop. They're gonna add a lot of sweetness to your flavor. If I pop one of these in my mouth, it's almost like sweet peas, tastes delicious. The big chunkier bits, they're fine too. You can toss them in if you're lazy just like that, but you get much better results when you slice them up super thin. I also like to put peppers in my stir fry. Peppers are really easy to cut up and there's you know a thousand different ways to chop these guys up. But the way that I prefer using, I don't want the stem, I don't want the majority of the pith and I don't want all those seeds and stuff in there. So I put it sort of head side up on my cutting board and using sort of a swooping motion, I cut it out just in little segments here. There we go, look at that. Once I take a couple of segments off, it's really easy to see what I'm working with here. That's the part that I don't wanna eat. That's part I don't wanna eat. So I'm gonna cut around that. And what I end up with on my cutting board here are some nice usable pieces. And then in my left hand, I'm left with this guy, which is what I don't want. So that guy goes away. Easy peasy, right? So I've been talking about putting your food upside down and making it sit flat. But that's not actually something I like to do with my peppers because this skin is, is waxy and it, it sort of shines and it really, my knife slides around on it quite a bit. So what I like to do upside down and I cut into the membrane side here. So I'm gonna take this guy, I'm gonna slice it up. I'm gonna slice this guy into some nice little julienne. Now I'm not gonna dice this up because I'm making a stir fry, right? We could certainly turn it on its side and we could dice them up like that, but I want them to be easy to pick up with my chopsticks or my fork. I also don't want to cut them too thin. If there's one thing that I don't like, it's overcooked vegetables. And if I apply too much heat to really, really thin peppers, they're gonna to start to turn to mush really fast. So I want them to have a little bit of thickness to them. There we go. Julienne peppers, nice little broccoli florets. We're well on our way to getting a really kick-ass stir fry. So ginger is an extremely important component in a lot of recipes, not just in stir fry. This guy's got range, right? It's one of the only ingredients I can think of that's got a great deal of crossover between a stir fry and a batch of cookies, you know? But there's a couple of hurdles we gotta jump over to get that nice sweet and spicy flavor out of there. It's always really irregular, so I just sort of break it apart into a few pieces the way it wants to come apart, right? I'm gonna take one of these guys, and I'm gonna peel it. Peel's the first thing, it's the first annoying thing we gotta deal with to get that delicious flavor out of ginger. The spoon is the ultimate tool to peel your ginger. You can use a peeler and you can fuss around with it, but you always end up taking off too much and it's tough to get into all the little nooks and crannies on this guy. You can use a paring knife. That works okay too, but it's easy to take off too much. It's also easy to cut yourself with it. So if you hold the spoon sort of in your hand with the, the head of the spoon behind your index finger and you use the edge here and you work towards your own thumb, it scrapes off really, really, really easily. Look at what I'm doing here. I'm getting all of this ginger hitting my cutting board. It's just skin. There's no flesh coming off of there. I'm not gonna cut myself with it. I mean, I'm probably not gonna cut myself with this, but I wouldn't put it past me, but it's really easy to do. All that skin just kind of schliffs off. If you have bought an excess of ginger, if you have too much ginger, you can pop it into the freezer in a Ziploc bag and it actually holds up for a couple of months. So keep that in mind. You don't want to waste food, right? So you get all this peel off here. That's super, super easy to do. This is your ultimate tool for peeling ginger. The next thing we got to deal with this guy, kind of like celery, it's got these fibers. It's got these fibers running through it. So if you ever like roasted a beef or something like that, if you got a nice pot roast, you always want to cut the meat against the grain. Because if you cut it with the grain, when you pop it in your mouth and you start chewing, it's going to be really, really chewy. It's going to take a while to process it, right? But if I cut against the grain, against all of these little 
pieces of string essentially that are in here, it's gonna be way, way, way more tender. So I'm gonna grab my Nakiri here. This is an awesome tool for doing this. So first of all, you wanna determine what way the grain is running. If you bought a piece of ginger and it's kinda of long, you can sort of assume that the grain is running up and down. Super, super easy to figure out. You can also, let's look at it. I can see on this guy, there's some little hairs coming off on the top here. I can see some hairs on the bottom. So I can sort of assume the grain is running vertically this way. So what I'm gonna do is take one cut with the grain. One with the grain so that I have a nice flat surface to put this guy down on. There we go, nice flat surface. I'm now going to position my claw over it and just like with my broccoli stem, I wanna slice this guy up super duper thin. Really, really thin is what we're going for here. So when I'm stir frying or if I'm making a curry, or if I'm gonna put this into a pan in any way, I don't really like to chop it all up really finely. I like to get a nice thin slice on it because once it hits that hot oil, once it starts getting tossed around in that pan, it's gonna to start to mellow out. It's gonna give up a little bit of that flavor and it's actually gonna take on a pretty nice texture. If I were to taste one of these super thin pieces, and it's really spicy. It's really, really spicy when you cut it super thin like that. Oh my God. But you gotta remember, it's gonna cook super fast when you do it that way. So you're gonna end up with all this nice cooked ginger flavor sort of making this beautiful melange with your sauce in there and you're gonna end up with a nice texture on that guy. This is the ultimate way to slice up ginger when you're making a stir fry. If you're gonna use the ginger raw, one of the best ways to do it is to grab like a microplane or a grater and just sort of do it up that way. But I find that when you're cooking your ginger, this is the best way to go. Beautiful, just like that. All right, so one thing we haven't really talked about yet is herbs. And herbs are a classic pitfall. If you're, if you're, if you're chopping up herbs, you wanna be nice and gentle with them. We're not eating herbs for sustenance. It's not like, oh, I go to the restaurant, oh, I'll have the parsley, please. No, 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 the, the parsley is sort of there, but it's like, it's playing a role and, and we wanna be gentle with it because the reason these guys taste good is because of the oil in the leaves. The oil and the leaves and the stem, that's why it tastes nice. So if I'm really mashing this guy, like if I take my knife and I'm doing one hand on top and I'm really just, just mashing this guy up, I'm gonna push all of the oil out you know, with a big weird green stain on your cutting board and your food doesn't have the same flavor to it. So I wanna be nice and gentle with this stuff. So what I typically like to do, I'll get rid of the stem, a lion's share of the stem there with that rubber band around it. That can go into my stock, take the rubber band off, but that can go into your stock. I'm gonna grab a little bundle of this guy. I'm not gonna chop it all up, let's grab a little bundle here. So what I like to do at this point is go through and take all of the leaves off of most of the stem. A little bit like that is fine. I just wanna get most of the stem dealt with. I'm just gonna pick through this real quick. End up with a nice little pile on my board. So the stems actually have quite a lot of flavor in them. So I do like to utilize those in other ways, primarily in my stock. But what I want with this for my nice simple salsa here is a nice soft texture, which that stem simply doesn't have. The leaves are nice and soft, as long as we work with them properly. And you get a nice texture and a nice flavor out of those guys. So we want to avoid being overtly rough with this stuff here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my non-dominant hand, I'm going to pick it up, nice and simple. I just pick it up and put it into my, my little fist around that guy. I'm not squishing it, I'm being gentle, just a nice gentle fist, which I then put down on the cutting board, just like that, right? Using my other hand, I sort of steady it, try to pinch it as well as I can in my claw here with that lead knuckle at the top. This is step number one. I just want to sort of make it a little bit more malleable here. I take a few slices using that claw. Don't worry about getting it super, super, super thin at this point. We just want to sort of get it into a nice little workable pile. We're going to get that pile a nice little bit of height. So this is the tricky part. This is the part that takes a little bit of judgment. You want to be really gentle with your knife. And this shape of knife is specifically great for this exact task. We're going to do something called mill chopping. So. Oh, once we start hearing that, it means it's time to push it back into a pile. Really, really nice and gentle. So this method does take a little bit more time than just going to town or throwing it in the food processor or something like that, but it's gonna re render you much more delicious results. I can really smell that coming into the air right now, that really nice sort of fresh parsley, really gentle aroma. There we go, super, super fine to dust. Nice, soft parsley. So there's an old saying among restaurateurs, the finer the parsley, the finer the restaurant. I don't know if any of you guys out there have ever worked at a restaurant before, but chopping parsley is a pretty big part of the job when you're in fine dining. If you ever do work at a restaurant, 
Under no circumstances should you let anybody know that you're any good at this. Otherwise, you're just going to be the parsley person for the rest of your friggin' life. If you take a close look here, I got my parsley in my hand. No weird green stain on my cutting board. Perfect. Look at that. It's so nice and gentle when you do it this way. You use a sharp knife, you use it gently. You don't end up with that big thing on your cutting board that you got to clean up afterwards. You're going to get a lot of flavor out of this stuff. Beautiful. So one of the most underutilized vegetables in the home kitchen today, I think, is the mighty shallot. A shallot kind of looks like an onion, but it kind of tastes like garlic. It's a little bit more of a base tone. It looks like an onion, so we're going to chop it up similar to the way that we did the onion. First thing I'm going to do is take off all the stuff that I do not want to eat. So the top, the bottom, I'm going to take this guy straight in half, just like I did with my onion, and then I'm going to peel it. Watch out though, these guys can be a little bit of a pain to peel sometimes. That skin's really stubborn. Ugh. I'm just gonna do half a shallot. Half a shallot's plenty. Shallots have a lot of flavor. You don't wanna be doing a whole lot of shallot in any single recipe. So remember when we did the onion, we did those radial cuts, those sort of angled cuts through that guy. We're gonna do something similar with this guy, but it doesn't need to be quite so precise. I'm gonna take this guy and I'm gonna do that same sort of idea where I don't cut all the way through. There's five cuts there is fine. And then I'm gonna do sort of a rough chop, a rough dice with this guy. There we go. So it's, it's nothing special to look at right now. It's sort of a big chunky little thing there. The way that I like to chop this guy up is sort of like a cross between the way I chop up my onions and my parsley. Once I got this guy sort of roughly chopped, I just sort of put it in the middle of my board, give it a little bit of height there. And then I sort of mill chop over it just like so. Keep wiping it off your blade and pushing it down onto the cutting board. Get a nice little pile there. Before long, it's going to start shrink. It's going to get nice and little. So this is where the tears come in. I always cry when I'm chopping up shallots. I guess that's just life, right? So keep going. Repeat that process. Push it into a little pile. Keep mill chopping over it until you decide that it's done. When I, when I see nice little pieces, if I don't see any big giant chunks that I know are gonna be unpleasant to bite into, that's when I stop. You do get to a point of diminishing returns with this guy. So if you chop it up for too long, you're gonna just end up turning it to mulch. It's just gonna sort of end up as a mush. And all of that flavor, just like the herbs, all of that flavor is gonna end up on your cutting board and it's not gonna end up in your mouth. Oh, I'm tearing up here, guys. They always get me. There we go. Beautiful, nice, minced stuff shallot there. Perfect for a tabbouleh or a salsa or something along those lines. So I saved the best for last. The tomato. The mighty tomato. We always have tomatoes on hand here at Knifeware to just show people how extraordinarily sharp our knives are. Because this is sort of a, a tricky skin to cut through, they actually wax them so they have a longer shelf life. You need a really, really sharp edge to get through that guy. So let's have a feel here. Oh yes. No problem, super easy, right? So what I wanna do for my salsa or my tabbouleh or whatever I'm making here, if I don't want it to be too goopy, what I wanna do is get rid of all of this seed on the inside here. All of these seeds and all of this goop are just gonna turn it to soup. So I'm gonna do something called tomato concasse. So to do a proper tomato concasse, you would first have to peel your tomatoes, which involves scoring a little X into the bottom, blanching them in boiling water, shocking them in cold water and then peeling the skin off. We're not gonna bother with that though. We're just making salsa. That's not necessary. What I do is cut them in half and then I cut them in quarters. Notice how I'm not cutting into the skin side. I'm cutting into the flesh side here. Way safer that way. So your knife doesn't skin around on that skin. So at this point, it's really easy to see. This is what we want down at the bottom here. That's sort of like, it's like the shell and we're almost gonna fillet these guys. And what I don't want is the goopy stuff up here. So I bring it sort of to the edge of my board and I fillet them out. I start at an angle and then I level it back down. I make sure to point the stem off to my left so that I can cut straight out. By the way, if you're left-handed, you want to point the stem to your right. So then I end up with my tomato inner and my tomato outer. There we go. Super simple. The tomato innards, by the way, you can still totally utilize tomato sauce. It's perfect for that sort of thing. They can also go into your stock. Tomatoes are awesome in stock, especially if you're making a dark stock with roasted bones. That's always a great ingredient to pop in there. And there we go. I got my nice little tomatoes here. I got my shells. What I'm gonna do with this guy 
is julienne. So first we julienne, then we dice. So with these guys, I wanna be really, really careful. I always wanna have that skin down towards the board because if it's facing up like that, my knife will slide around on it and I run the risk of cutting myself a little bit more easily, which sucks, obviously, we don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna cut this into maybe, I don't know, four or five pieces there, a little tomato, four pieces. I line them up and then I dice them. Super easy there. So what you choose to do with your tomato and your shallot and your herbs is entirely up to you. You can certainly just squeeze some fresh lime, some salt, a little bit of olive oil in there and just mix it on up and you got yourself a really nice simple salsa. You could put some chopped mint in there and then you'd have a nice tabbouleh. Just sort of a nice melange of, nice melange of flavors in there and we can do whatever we like with that. Well, thanks a lot for watching guys. That was a lot of fun and I hope you took something away from the class. Some key points that you always want to remember, use a sharp knife. All of these techniques that I talked about, you've got to have a sharp knife to use them. I uh, Try to manipulate the food in a way so that it sort of sits flat and stable on your cutting board before you start going to town on it. That's going to reduce the risk of injury by a great, great, great margin. Use proper tools. Use a proper cutting board. Always have a rag on hand to clean up and keep your station nice and clean at all times. Make the best utilization of your space. It's, it's simple stuff, but what it really requires, the most important thing here is to practice. Cook at home. Try to cook at home at least four nights a week. It's a great skill to have. You can develop the better habits. You'll eat better overall. Awesome stuff. If you have any more questions, always visit nightfloor.com. We're more than happy to help with any queries that you have. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a great day.